fact, his father, David Grossman, our learning should be the Ilinishmas, David Ben Menachem Monash. This morning's shoe is also dedicated by dear friends Jeremy and Meryl Strauss in commemoration of the earth site of Mr. Michael Strauss, Oliver Shalom, Jeremy's father, and by Faye and Murray Eisenberg in honor of the publication of their son in law's new safer on Tehillim. There's a copy, everyone should purchase it. Well worth it. Tehillim Songs of the Heart, Shlomo Dov Letterstein. Shavalad Nachas, Mazel Tov on the publication of the Sefer. This week we have the privilege of reading and studying Parshas Bahar, page 696. Often Bahar and the Chukosai go together, and then we can't fully appreciate either. But this year we're reading this separate and apart, and we have the opportunity to delve into it a little bit further. By the Be'er Shem Moshe Bahar Sinai Lemor, the Parsha begins, Hashem spoke to Moshe, and here the Torah sort of deviates from its norm and tells us the topography the area in which Hashem spoke to Moshe. He spoke to him where? Bahar Sinai. He spoke to him at Har Sinai. Now again, we know that all of Torah come from Har Sinai. Everything comes from Har Sinai. Rashi, of course, famously asked this question. Ma inyan Shemitah etzel Har Sinai. We're about to be introduced to the laws of Shemitah. This is a Shemitah year. We find ourselves right now in a Shemitah year. What in the world does Shemitah have to do with Har Sinai? And Rashi answers, and, and Rashi is bothered by local mitzvahs, nemer misinai. Shemitah is not the only mitzvah that was given in Har Sinai. Every mitzvah. Moshe Kibot Torah Misinai. Moshe received the totality of Torah, an entire framework of mitzvahs, all of the written Torah at Sinai. So why Shemitah? Ela, ma Shemitah, namru, klolo, sao, prato, sao, v'diktu, kem, misinai. Afkula, namru, klolo, sao, v'diktu, kem, misinai. So Rashi answers just like Shemitah has general broad principles and has specific details. And all of it comes from Sinai. So to all mitzvahs, the broad general principles and the fine details, all that comes from Sinai. Orachaim points out that Rashi kind of pulls a fast one on us. Did Rashi answer his original question? Rashi wants to know all mitzvahs are given at Sinai. If all mitzvahs are given at Sinai, what's special about Shemitah? And he answers, well, Shemitah is a paradigm. Shemitah is a model, it's an archetype. Just like Shemitah, the general principles and the details were given, so to all mitzvahs. Okay. But all mitzvahs, the general principles and the details were given. We still have an answer. Why is Shemitah chosen as the archetype? Why is Shemitah the paradigm? Why is Shemitah the example from which we learn and apply to everything else? That's the question of the Arachayim. We've discussed it in the past. So I'm not going to answer it now. But it is the way our parasha begins. And therefore, I wanted to raise it again for you. So we're introduced to the laws of Shemitah. When you enter the land that I'm going to give you, you should observe, the land should observe a Shabbos, a Shabbos Lashem, six years you plant your field, six years you prune your vineyard, and you gather the crop, and on the seventh year, oh, Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos Lashem, your land is tired. Your land has worked hard. You've worked hard. You deserve a sabbatical. You deserve a break. You deserve time to yourself. Some of the commentaries point out that the Torah here is out of order. When presenting Shemitah, how should it have been presented? First, six years you work, six years you prune, six years you harvest, and then the seventh year, now Shemitah, now you have the sabbatical year. The Torah sort of tells us out of order. First, the Torah tells us, the Shavta Aretz, you're going to rest. And then we begin the cycle of six years of work. Why does the Torah tell it to us out of order? This too, I'm just giving you questions right now. I have to give you some homework. To give you for your own Shabbos table some things to consider. So here too, the commentators point out, it's out of order. Why is it out of order? What does it tell us? We know, in fact, that when they came into the land of Israel, they did not start by observing Shemitah. They didn't, in fact, start till the 21st year. There were seven years of conquest and seven years of division, and only then seven years of Shemitah. So the first Shemitah was the 21st year after they entered the land, which makes the question more compelling. We don't begin with Shavta, Aretz, Shabbos, Lashem, and then six years you work the land. It began with first you conquer, then you divide, then you work the land, and then the 21st year, the seventh year, the end of the first Shemitah cycle, that's when you observe Shemitah. So why does the Torah give it to us seemingly what sounds like somewhat out of 
out of order. Roshana Ashri is on the seventh year. Ah, Shabbat Shabbaton. A Sviach Kisir Chalosik Torah. Then we get into some of the details of how Shemitah is observed. The Shavta Aret Shabbos Lashem. So we said the Torah describes Shavta Aret, the land has to rest. And why? Why does the land rest? It's a lot to talk about here. We've spoken about much of it in the past. Is Shemitah about the farmer? Is Shemitah about the land? The answer is both. On the one hand, we're not environmentalists in the sense that we serve the land. The land serves us. But for the land to best serve us, it needs to rest. You cannot overwork something. You cannot overwork it. Sometimes it needs to shut down. It needs to rest. It needs to rest in order to return, in order to recover, in order to be at its optimal production, efficiency, productivity, and so on. You know, 90% of the time, if you have a problem with your computer or your phone, just turn it off and let it sit for a couple minutes and it will resolve itself. Sometimes it's so clogged with noise, with information, with apps, it's running too much memory. It just needs to rest. When you disconnect it and let it rest, then it's going to work again. I must have told you the story in the past of the time that I was on a plane and we were about to take off. We actually went down the runway, picked up speed, and the nose of the plane was about to lift off. And suddenly at the last minute, the pilot slammed on the brakes. And he came on the loudspeaker and he explained a light came on on the panel saying there was a problem. And he didn't want to take off with the light on, which I thought was a very wise decision. was grateful for it. So he said, we're just going to fix it and then we'll take off. No problem. So we sat on the plane and time began to pass. And then the engineers came on the plane and time began to pass. And they couldn't figure out why this light was on and what needed to be corrected in order for the light to go off. So they announced, you know, we're going back to the gate while we fix this. If you like, feel free to get off the plane, come back on the plane. You can go shop, get something to eat. It's going to take a little while. So as we got off the plane, I whispered to the pilot as I was passing in the cockpit, somewhat of a smart aleck, I said, why don't you just try, try what I do with my computer and phone? Just turn it off and turn it back on again. They didn't appreciate that. Anyway, I got off the plane, got something to eat, came back on. Still took a little bit while. Pilot came on the plane and he said, we haven't figured it out, but we shut down the plane. We turned it back on. The light did not come back on, so we're going to take off. And we took off and here and here we are. So the point is that the land it needs to be shut down. Sometimes you need to disconnect and you need to let the land rest. And then the land can be productive. It's about the land, but it's also equally or even more about the farmer. The farmer too needs to rest. And the farmer needs to be rooted and the farmer needs to recalibrate his and her compass. They need to dedicate themselves to not only the service of a land, of the physical world, but of Hashem, of Emunah. It's an exercise in bitachon and in Emunah. So the Tapasik says, V'shav aretz, the land should rest. Why? Shabbos Lashem. And Rashi here writes, what does it mean, Shabbos Lashem? Everything is for Hashem, isn't it? Every mitzvah we do is for Hashem. Sunday through Friday are for Hashem, and Shabbos is for Hashem. The six years we work the land is for Hashem, and the seventh year of the sabbatical of Shemitah is for Hashem. So what does it mean, Shabbos Lashem? Zot Rashi, L'shem Hashem. L'shem Hashem, L'shma. Let the land rest, not because you belong to some environmental club. Let the land rest, not because it makes sense to you, but l'shma, l'shem Hashem, do it for God. So the Ramban is bothered, and the Ramban asks on Rashi. Every Shabbos and every Moed is l'shem Hashem. So why does Rashi specifically tell us, or why does the Torah specifically tell us that Shemitah is Shabbos l'shem? Every holiday, every Shabbos, every mitzvah that we do, we do in order to draw close to Hashem. We do because He tells us, not because we thought of it on our own. So in his Das Torah, Rabbi Yerucham, the Mashkiach of the Mir, explains based on a comment of the Raivet. The Raivet, in his introduction to a Sefer Balei Nefesh, says, The purpose of all of mitzvot is that God says, jump, we say, how high? The purpose of all of mitzvot is for us to admit and to concede and to submit and to surrender that we don't navigate the world based on the way we want or what makes sense to us, but all mitzvahs are an exercise in our submitting to Hashem. Hashem says, I created, I designed this world, you're a guest in it, and here is how to operate. Here is the best way to live. Here's how to get the most out of it. Here's how you'll find the greatest happiness. Here's how you can be of the highest service. Here's how you can fulfill your mission in it. All of mitzvahs are to know that we have a borei. That's why we make a bircha sa mitzvah. We say a bracha before we do a mitzvah because we return and remind ourselves of the fact that there is a creator 
and he charges us to do this mitzvah. And that we don't have the luxury or the freedom to simply live the way we want. We don't make sense of the world in a way that is convenient or comfortable for us. But we're here to serve. We're here to serve him. He doesn't serve us. We are here to fulfill a mission. We're here to give, not to take. We're here for a reason. And every mitzvah is a reminder. The root of the word mitzvah is litzavos, means to connect. The mitzvah is the means through which we connect to Hashem. It is a connection. We bind ourselves to Hashem. We surrender to Hashem. We listen and we have an interest in fulfilling His will and His word. So according to this, Shabbos Hashem doesn't mean sheyesh notzibu lechavin l'shem Hashem. You're right. Tfilin and Sitzis and Kashras, every mitzvah is supposed to be L'Shem Hashem. They're all supposed to be done and designated in the service of Hashem, L'Shema. Why then does it specifically say Shabbos L'Hashem for Shemitah? And the same language is used for Shabbos that comes at the end of each and every week. What do the two things have in common, says Rav Yerucham? At the end of a long week, at the end of a long six years, a person can mistakenly think, this is my world, my success, my ingenuity, my creativity, my entrepreneurship, my hard work, this success is mine. I've broken through. I've made progress. I've mastered the world. I've manipulated the world. It's my strength. It's my wisdom. It's my hard work. It's my diligence. Shabbos Lashem. Hey, buddy, relax. Disconnect. You can't so much as turn on a light switch. You think this is your world. You think you control and manipulate. You think everything is your success. You think you can micromanage and power and be in control. You can't even flip on a light switch. You can't even take the jelly bean you like from the ones you don't like or the ones you don't like from the ones you like. You can't even... The Malachas of Shabbos. 39 categories of creative labor. Sit tight. Be passive to nature and to the world. Make peace. Hashem says, a little shtickle reminder. It's my world. You're just a guest in it. I am in charge. Yes, six days of the week. Work. Keep Shua. Conquer. Control. Manipulate. Learn. Master the world. But then one day a week, instead of being active, we're passive. One day a week, instead of being in control, we relinquish control. And we sit back and we say, Hashem, you're in charge. So therefore, L'Shem Hashem. There is no Anochi. There is no I. There is no ego. There is no power struggle. One day a week, we stop and we let go and we let God. One day a week, we stop trying to control his world. Says Rabbi Yerucham, this is the connection, the common denominator between Shabbos and Shemitah. B'tom achshavos ha-bailas she'odom edam al the common denominator of Shabbos, which is the seventh day of the week, and Shemitah, the seventh year of the seven-year cycle. Notice everything is in similar units and parallel in time. But the common theme is work, conquer. You're not holy and righteous, by the way, if you say, you know what? God loves Shemitah so much. God wants to respect the earth and let it rest. God wants me to be a bomb. Bitachon and Amuna, he wants me to not work. I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep every year Shemitah year. I'm not going to work. I'll collect from the community. I'll walk around and rely on the Kupa Staka. I'll let Karen Hashvias operate not only the seventh year, but support me all seven years. Rav Moshe Feinstein points out, notice that the Torah says, It doesn't just tell us the mitzvah of Shemitah. It tells us there's also a mitzvah to work the six years. And the same is true when it comes to Shabbos. See, unlike other religions where work is a concession, really in the ideal we don't work, but we have to work because how else will we live? How else will we survive? So it's a concession to a reality. Judaism sees work not as a concession. Judaism sees work as a value. How many Mishnayas, Pirkei Avos, and elsewhere that tell us the Torah learning that doesn't have Malacha with it is so fully, but it's not real. A person has to be diligent and work we were born to derive an enormous satisfaction and self-worth by the work that we do, by the difference that we make, by a sense of accomplishment that we gain and that we have. 
We're meant to make a difference in this world, to master this world, to work in this world. The same is true with Shabbos. We're told six days work, and then the seventh you rest. And how do we know that's noble? How do we know it's meaningful? How do we know that in itself is a mitzvah? We're emulating the Ribbon Shalom. Hashem did it. It doesn't just say that Hashem created the world. He could have created the world in one moment and then had seven days of Shabbos. It says six days he was occupied with creation. Now, for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, creation was just speech. He spoke and the world came to be. For Hashem, there was no work involved. But Kiviyachal, as if he worked six days to model for us and create the precedent for us of the idea of working for six days and then being able to rest in the seventh. So Biruchim says, why does Rashi come to you? L'shem Hashem. Shemitah is L'shem Hashem. Unlike other mitzvahs, every mitzvah is L'shem Hashem. So Biruchim, the Ramban asked that question. So Biruchim explains, no. Shabbos and Shemitah have in common is, I might swell with pride. I might grow arrogant and egotistical and think these are my accomplishments. I'm in control. Every seventh day and every seventh year, we stop and we say, Hashem, you're in control. You are in charge, not me. Not me. The Pasuk said the seventh year is a Shabbos, a Shabbaton. Shemitah, we have a year-long Shabbaton for Hashem. We just said, Shabbos Lashem. So why are we repeating it? Pasuk Beis, it says, V'shavta Aretz Shabbos Lashem. Pasuk Gimel, sorry, in Pasuk Dalet again, V'shav HaShvish, Shabbat Shabbat Son, Yelo Aretz. Why are we repeating ourselves? So Rabbi Eliezer Lopian, Rosh Hashiva of Taurus Emes, he said, Don't think Shashana Sashmita, Hilo Menucha Seicha, Guf Nisa, Lotova Saaretz, Shetach Lich Kocha, Shabbos Lashem. Kol HaShana HaShvish, Shana Shalavod HaShem, Shana Shalavod HaShem, Shana Shlema Shetuch LaHaktish, do you begin to know the schedule of a farmer? We had a farmer speak in our shul earlier this year, and then we interviewed her on Behind the Bima. It's well worth listening. You can find it online in the archives of Behind the Bima. Alana Twig, she and her husband Doron have a farm for many years, intergenerational, and she described the life and the schedule of a farmer who rises before dawn, who is exhausted and works the land all day, who doesn't have time for other important pursuits like the study of Torah or his this being in conversation with Hashem, farmers working that field diligently, toiling tirelessly. It's the seventh year when I asked her in the interview, no, what are you doing with your time off? It is an unpaid sabbatical. It's one thing to have a paid sabbatical. The farmer in Shemitah has an unpaid sabbatical. So she said, we're learning. We picked up Svarim and we're learning. We're learning. That's what we're doing. And that's Shabbat Shabbat Son, Shabbat Lashem. Yes, the land is rejuvenating. Yes, the farmer is resting and recuperating. But ultimately, what's the reason for Shemitah? The reason ultimately is Shabbos Lashem. It's about finding Hashem back in our life, returning and restoring our sense of feeling His presence each and every day in everything that we do, knowing that He's with us wherever we go, always at all times. Okay, let's keep going. Perak Chaf Hey. We go through some of these laws of Shemitah, and then we move over to Yovel. After the 49th year comes, after seven Shemitah cycles, is Yovel. Is Yovel. And the Pasuk here says, Per Chafei Pasuk Yud Zayin. Turn to page 698. In this context, we're talking about uh, Yovel, and in Yovel the slaves go free, the land returns to its ancestral ownership. Al tonu isha sachiv, you're not allowed to aggravate or grieve your friend. Each of you shall not aggravate, aggrieve. Basically, loosely translates as, don't be a jerk. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be mean. Be kind. Be sensitive. Be compassionate. Have midos tovos, a basic derech eretz, against other people. This is the prohibition of ona'as dvarim. We have two prohibitions of ona in the Torah. We have a prohibition of ona in the Torah, which is financial, economical. You're not allowed to charge extreme interest, exorbitant interest. What's defined as exorbitant interest? So the Gemara distinguishes between a sixth, more than a sixth, and less than a sixth. A sixth over the market rate or the market price. If you're charging less than a sixth, it's forgiven. If you're charging a sixth, you've got to return it, but the sale stands. More than a sixth, the sale is nullified because you are charging an exorbitant markup. You can't charge such a march, markup. So we have a prohibition of ona'as mamon. When it comes to the world of money, you cannot just overcharge. There's an enormous shortage right now of formula. 
So let's say you happen to have a six pack of formula and you know somebody who needs. So you decide, you know what? My time has come. This is how I'm going to finally get rich. I have formula. Nobody else does. I'm going to charge $1,000 a bottle of formula. What mother won't pay whatever it takes in order to help her baby survive? It's hard to believe that in 2022, we're like a third, a fourth world country that we can't produce basics, necessity for a baby formula. So that's a prohibition of Ona'a. So there's something called the Ona'as Mamon that has a specific measure. And here you have the prohibition of Ona'as Dvarim. Ona'as Dvarim is when you mislead. It's an example of Ona'as Dvarim. Let's say you go to the hospital to visit your friend. And on the way in, you learn someone else is in the hospital. You visit them and they say, wow, you came to the hospital just to see me? I'm so honored and touched. It means so much that you came to see me. It's a little Ona'as Dvarim. On the one hand, you let them down to know that actually I was coming anyway. Could be Onaz Dvarim. Could be a prohibition of Onaz Dvarim. My daughter, uh, Baruch Hashem, got engaged recently. Everyone's invited to the board on Motzeh Shabbos, 9.30 here at the shul. Love to have you. But the L'chaim was in New York. So one of my Rebbe and Rebbe Willig came to the L'chaim. So my Rebbe and the new Mechotin's Rebbe. So Rebbe Willig, who's at Sada, came in and must have said five times, I didn't come all the way from Riverdale to Woodmere for the L'chaim. I needed to be here anyway. I just scheduled why I needed to be here so that I could be here for the L'chaim as well. He went out of his way to make sure he wasn't violating Onaz Dvarim, lest he mislead us to think that he schlepped and came all the way and we would be honored by something that wasn't true. And then we find out later that really, he also had to pay a shiva call. Really, he was also giving a shir. Really, he also had a meeting. So there's also a prohibition of Onaz Dvarim. The Gemara Bamatziah says, which is worse? Which is more severe? The prohibition of Anaz Dvarim or Anaz Mamon? Overcharging someone or misleading, aggravating them emotionally? Zak the Gemara, Gedola Onaz Dvarim Onaz Mamon, Shezeb Gufo, Vizeb Mamono. Onaz Dvarim is worse because what you do to a person's psyche, what you do to manipulate a person's emotions or mislead them is much more damaging. It's much more injurious than what you do to them financially. It's just money. You can recover money. I don't mean to minimize people struggling with money. We're going to talk about in our parsha momentarily. When someone is struggling financially, it is very, very significant. It's not just money, but money can be recovered. But when you mislead someone, when you steal their trust, when you violate their trust, when you aggravate and manipulate them emotionally, and that's why the Gemara Bab says the pasuk says ani Hashem. So the Balei Musar explain. Say the Balei Musar. Onaz Mamon has a set measure, less than a sixth, a sixth, more than a sixth. But when you're pogei b'chaveiro bidvarim, when you say something hurtful or mean, when you call a nickname they don't want to use, when you distort or lie, when you violate the trust, so only a Kaddish Baruch Hu knows the sheer, only a Kaddish Baruch Hu knows the depth of how much you hurt them. And that's why, Ani Hashem, Pasuk ends, Lo sonu isha samiso, why? V'yarei sami'elo kecha. When you go to that hospital room, when you go to that l'chaim, and you mislead the person to believe that you made this great effort for them, nobody will ever know. What's the problem? Why not be thought of as such a tzaddik? Why not make a deposit in the bank account of that relationship they think that you went so far for them? Who's going to know? So the Pasuk says, V'yareisa me'elokecha. You know who's going to know? God always knows. Hashem knows why you're there. Hashem knows what you're thinking. Hashem knows the truth. Ani Hashem. Because I am Hashem and I am everywhere, don't think that you can mislead. You can fool yourself and you can even fool others, but you cannot fool Hashem. And therefore, it's more severe, says the Gemara. Onas Mamon has a set measure, a sixth. That's the halacha. But Onas Dvarim, you may think that nobody knows and you'll get away with it. You have to be very, very careful. It's a story. If Desla on Shabbos would make Kiddush from a cup, a Kiddush cup that he got as a gift, from his uncle, Reb Chaim Oizer Grzynski. He got a special Kiddush cup from his uncle, Reb Chaim Oizer. And this Kiddush cup, Reb Chaim Oizer himself got from the grandfather of his first wife, Reb Yisrael Salanter, the great founder of the Muslim movement. So Reb Chaim Oizer used the Kiddush cup and he gave it as a wedding gift to Reb Dessler. He used it as a Kiddush cup. When Reb Dessler went to live in Bnei Brak, he became aware that the Chazanish had his own shear, had his own measure for the minimum amount of a Kiddush cup so he would say Kiddush and Avdallah and the like. And this Kiddush cup that he had through his wife, this Kiddush cup that he got as a gift from Chaim Moser, that his wife very much uh, cherished, 
this Kiddush cup was less than that minimum measure of the Chazanish. So the question was, what should he do? He's in Bnei Brak, the city of the Chazanish. Do you adopt the measure of the Kiddush cup of the Chazanish? Or do you continue to use the Kiddush cup that is the family heirloom that's meaningful to his wife? So Rav Desla continued to use the Kiddush cup that meant so much to his wife. And the first Shabbos, after his wife passed away, he set that Kiddush cup, put it in the break front, used the new Kiddush cup, that would be that minimum shear. You see that he prioritized Onaz Dvarim. It would have aggravated his wife. It would have caused her pain to not use or to suggest that the earlier generations hadn't fulfilled Kiddush. And so though he himself wanted to adopt the stricter position, he waited till it would not be a violation of Onaz Dvarim. Onaz Dvarim is worse than Onaz Mamam. Per Chafei, Pasuk And I love this next Dvar Torah I'm about to tell you. So I hope you've been listening carefully, but if you haven't, listen up now. Per Chafei, Pasuk Chaf. Torah tells us the following. V'chi Somru. You know what's going to happen? Shemitah. The farmer is charged. Again, we don't live in an agrarian agricultural society other than our new friends, Alana and Doron. We don't really relate. But can you imagine the farmer is told every seventh year, unpaid sabbatical, sitting here and watching live or later are people, lawyers and accountants and doctors and entrepreneurs and business people. Imagine every seventh year you're told, sit and learn, don't work, no work this year. And by the way, it's not like a rabbi or a professor at a university that you've earned your paid sabbatical. Be nice. It's not earned your paid sabbatical. It's an unpaid sabbatical. So you can't help but ask, somru. you're going to say, oh, got it, God, I got it. Land should rest. Like the airplane, you got to just shut it down so it could rejuvenate. It can reset itself. I got it. Land's going to rest. I'm going to rest. I'm going to be in a cold all year. I'm going to shy guys. I'm going to learn with you. But I've got one little question. What am I supposed to eat that year? How am I supposed to pay the mortgage that year? How do I pay the bills? We're not planting and we're not harvesting. We're not taking in a drawing in an income. What are we supposed to eat? Says the Torah a promise. Oh, the sixth year will grow so much, you'll have enough for the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth year. Some point out they want to suggest. You see from here, this is one of the pieces of evidence of the divine authorship of the Torah. We have several places in Torah where a promise is made that only a divine person, a divine individual, could fulfill that promise. No man or group of people who would have authored a document would make a promise they couldn't fulfill. If, if a group of people wrote the Torah, how long would this religion last? Seven years. In the sixth year, when you didn't grow enough for the sixth, seventh, and eighth year, in the seventh year, when you had an unpaid sabbatical and nothing to eat and you starved to death, that would be the end of the religion. The fact that the Torah promises, relax, don't worry. You're going to grow enough in the sixth, seventh, and eighth years. You will be good to go. You have nothing to worry about. Is in itself, some say, evidence for the divine authorship of the Torah. That and the fact that the Torah tells us exactly the species of which are the exceptions to fins and scales and split hooves and chewing cud and the laws of kashras. The Torah doesn't just tell us generically. It makes a promise, and it names the exceptions of the species. Again, how long would a religion last until you find that there's more exceptions? And you say the Torah was wrong, it was off. A group of people would never make that promise that they couldn't fulfill. They could never know all the species across the globe. Only Hashem could. So, some suggest that is evidence of the divine authorship. But I want to share with you a different insight. A famous kasha of the Noam Elimelech, the Helig of Noam Elimelech, the Elimelech of Lezhinsk. And he asks the following, why does the Torah present this in a roundabout way? Why does the Torah present us? Hashem says, don't worry, I got your back. You're going to grow enough in the sixth year for the sixth, seventh, and eighth year. Why doesn't Hashem just tell us that? Keep Shemitah, six years, work your field. Six years, prune your vineyard. In the seventh year, rest, and don't worry, there'll be enough in the sixth, seventh, and eighth year. Why does the Torah not just tell it to us as a reality? Why does it couch it? Why does it communicate it in an indirect roundabout way by saying, when you'll ask, when you'll be bothered, when you'll worry. Why does it tell us that when you'll worry, why not just tell us the din that what? In the sixth year, you'll grow enough for the sixth, seventh, and eighth year. It's the cash of the normal Melach. Many answers are given. 
But Rabbi Bender, Rabbi Yaakov Bender, in this beautiful Sefer on Chumash, I'm a big Rabbi Bender fan. In the Sefer, he says the following answer. Such a beautiful answer. Listen carefully. It's fantastic. He says, Shemitah is an Isayan. It's a test of faith. And the Gemara praises the strength of the farmers who, after six years of toil and single-minded focus, turn their back on their field and let them lie forsaken in the hand of Hashem. By the way, just think about that also. You build a business. It's your baby. You love it. It's yours. And now the Torah says, turn your back on it. Neglect it. Let it go for a year. Again, we don't relate to it necessarily in the form of the farm, but you could think of it as a business. You're an entrepreneur. You've worked hard. You've built up a website, an e-commerce business, a business offline. You've worked tirelessly to build up a business. In the seventh year, we say, start all over again. You're going to lose all the reviews. You're going to lose all the momentum. You're going to lose all the customer base. You're going to lose all your clients. Turn your back on your business. That's what the farmer is being asked to do. Turn your back on your business after working hard to build it up for six years. Every seventh Shemitah in the cycle is another year. Yovel, farmer has to wait a second year. The field into which he invested such energy and heart, lying fallow, overgrown, and overrun. It's not easy. It's an Isayon. And Isayonis are not meant to be easy. Isayon means a test. The Torah is saying it's okay to ask, to express the worry and fear. What will we eat? What will be? How will we manage? Will we be okay? How will we pay the bills? You hear what Rebender? Rosh Hashim of Darche. His answer, no Malimel's question. Why didn't the Torah just tell it to us there'll be enough in the sixth year for the sixth, seventh, and eighth? Why does it tell it to us in the roundabout way? And when you'll ask, says Ravender, you know why? The Torah here is giving license to worry. The Torah is saying, it's okay to ask what's going to be. It's okay to worry. It's okay to have this question in the first place. He writes, in many homes, children are protected from the harsher realities of life, assured that everything's going to be okay. Over the months of COVID-19 pandemic, this became impossible. Children are very much part of every conversation and deliberation. They heard the doubt, felt the worry and the uncertainty. And they wondered if it is okay to complain to express their own frustration and anxiety. And the answer is a resounding, yes. The Torah here is saying, yes. It's okay to say, what will be? When will this pandemic end? When will I be off Zoom and back in school? Will we be okay? Will everyone I know and love survive? Can you imagine what it's like for our young people in school, out of school, shuttled here and there in lockdown or quarantine? We cannot always make the situation perfect, but we can reassure them within the challenge and letting them share what they are feeling is part of reassurance. And we all know it's not just children. Adults also need to unburden themselves sometimes. To correct and to deprive someone of that chance is cheating them. To tell someone, no, you should just live with perfect faith and everything is amazing. It's not realistic to tell someone who's waiting for lab results to return or for a medical test which can have grave consequence to come back. Don't think about it. It's all good. It's all from Hashem. Yes, every Wednesday morning we work on living with Amuna. Yes, when you live with Amuna, we gain the strength and the resilience and the fortitude to face whatever comes our way. But it's only natural and it's only normal to crack and to worry and to express a little concern about what will be. And says Rav Bender, here the Torah is giving license. The Torah communicates it in this way. Don't perseverate. Don't become totally debilitated by your thoughts, anxiety, and worry, and fear. At some point, one has to lean into their faith. But the fact that there is concerns, of course there are concerns. You're normal. How do you know? The Gemara Psachim Daf Nun. Rav Achabachanina taught the next world is not like this world. In this world, when you hear good news, you say a bracha. What bracha? You win the lottery. What bracha do you say? Not just win the lottery. You buy a new home. You buy a car, something others will benefit from. You make a bracha. Hatova metiv. In this world, if you hear bad news, what do you say? person loses a loved one or you lost your fortune. Stock market's been down. A lot of people have lost a lot of money. So far, they've lost it on paper. But if in reality, a person loses a lot of money or fortune, they recite this bracha, the Shulchan Aruch says. Baruch, baruch atashem, okay, malach olam, dayan, haemes. Whereas in the next world, the Gemara says, in this world, good news, you say, atova metiv. In this world, bad news, you say, Dayan HaMS God, you're the judge of truth. But in the next world, on all news, good or what seems bad, you'll make the bracha tova metiv. Because in the next world, we'll understand how all is for the good. Says Rabender, the Gemara is telling us that in the world to come, even tidings that seem bad are perceived in the truest sense. We'll see them as innately good. Rabbi Yitzchak Kutner, the great Pachad Yitzchak, in his pithy way, would remark, 
Shtedu, what we see here is that in this world, of a person who hears bad news, let's say you hear bad news in this world. You hear that your loved one died. You hear that you lost a fortune. You hear that your house burned to the ground. And you're such a tzaddik, you said, Olam. you're such a mam in Babi Tachon. And you want to prove to the world how much faith you have that when you hear that your house burned to the ground, when you hear that you lost your loved one, you say, Baruch atah Hashem, Lokein Melech Olam, Hatov Hashem, you're the best. Said Ravutno, you know what that is? A bracha levatala. The Gemara says that's a bracha levatala. You're not supposed to make that bracha on bad news in this world. You're not supposed to be such a grace at tzaddik. Don't pretend to be something you're not. We have avelis. You grieve, you mourn. There's a sense of loss. You lose your home. Or the more so, you lose a loved one. It's natural and it's normal to grieve. You don't make a tova metiv, hatshat. That's called a bracha levatala, faker. That's a bracha levatala. In the next world, we'll make a tova metiv, even on bad news. But we're living in this world. And in this world, we're governed by our nature and our natural instinct. And in this world... A hatov ha'metiv on bad news would be a bracha levatala. It's okay. It's okay to say v'chisamru ma'nocha b'shana shviz. It's okay to say what's going to be and when will this end and what will it look like on, when we come out of it. It's okay to ask those questions. The Torah is telling us and the Torah is telling us to tell our children that we shouldn't have anxiety, that we shouldn't be overly fearful, that we shouldn't have a, a crisis of faith, we have to work on ourselves to realize that Hashem is in charge, Hashem is in control, whatever will be is what's meant to be, and that should give us the calm that we need. But to first face the fear, to feel the chisom rum anochal, to ask the question, is only normal. Jews don't grumble or express grievance, of course, but to share the pain, to speak it out, is not just all right, it's healthy. Pasuk in Mishlei says, Daiga belev ish, yashchena. If you have worry in the heart of man, yashchena. The Gemara in Yuma, if I and hey teaches, what does it mean, Yashchena? Yashchena la'acherim. Yashchena, the word comes from a sicha. Have a conversation with others. When you're worried, express it to others. Articulate the worry. Speak. Speak to parents, speak to friends, speak to Rebbeim, the teachers, and speak to the Rebbeim Shalom. Tell them about your worries. We don't have a religion that Hashem says, I want you to lean in with such faith in me that there's no room for you to ever express worry. No. V'chisamru manochal. Turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, frankly, I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about myself. I'm worried about my marriage. I'm worried about my parnasa. It's okay. It's a gishmak vort, no? What an insight. What an answer to the Hele Genoma Malach. Why didn't the Torah just tell us the halacha? Why didn't the Torah just tell us the reality? That in the sixth year, Hashem will give enough of the sixth, seventh, and eighth. Why did it couch it first? When you'll ask, what if we don't ask? Why does it tell us when you'll ask? Strange. Says Rabender. To tell us it's okay to ask, it's okay to worry. Oh, what a geschmack board. Perakafe Pasak Chaf Gimel. Moving right along. The arts lo simacher litz misus ki li ha arts ki gerim beso shavim atem imadi. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity. The land is mine. You are simply sojourners and residents with me. You're guests. You're simply guests. You don't have an attitude at the hotel as if it's your room. You know you checked in, you know you're checking out, and you're there temporarily. You are a guest, the famous story of the Chavetz Chaim, who lived in simplicity when asked why. He said, how come you don't bring all your things to the hotel room? Your furniture, your furnishings, hanging the paintings and the pictures on the wall. Why don't you set it up as your own? The answer is, because the hotel, you're only there temporarily. You're only passing through. For the, for the Chavetz Chaim, this world was like a hotel room, only passing through. So the Torah here says that the laws of Yovel, in which the land reverts to its previous owner, is a reminder to us that we never have a true ownership over the land. It's never really fully ours. We don't have a true ownership over that land. Ha'aretz lo simacher. The, the Pasuk says, Ve'aretz lo simacher misus. Ki liko la'aretz. It's mine. Rabbi Yerucham writes on this Pasuk again. This is Rabbi Yerucham in his Das Torah. Mashkiach of the Mir. Yisod mitzvah sashviyas munach b'milam elu. The whole source, the whole core. We are in a Shemitah year. This is relevant to all of us outside the land of Israel when it comes to Shemitah's Kesef, Ksafim, when it comes to the end of this year, the forgiveness of loans, unless you sign a Prisbol. But it's relevant. I was in Israel last week for three days, and observing Shemitah in Israel today is complicated. Do you hold it Hetem Achira? What food do you hold? Which kashras? How do you observe Shemitah? A Shemitah year in Israel is very, very significant. Zman Biur, you have to know 
the specific time for each food, when is the last time it's available, then it's subject to beer, you have to do, um, you have to be mafkar it, you have to relinquish ownership over it, it's complicated. So what's at the core of these complicated laws of Shemitah, of Shvius, says Rabbi Rucham, in these three words. It's all captured in these three words. We are in a Shemitah year, Hefra. If you want to feel Shemitah, think about and work on these three words. What are they? Kili Ha'aretz. God says, the land is mine. So admits a Shemitah, she'yargil adam is atz malachios apim tzius, kili kol ha'aretz. Shu eno balabayis. You have a beautiful home you've worked hard to buy and to build. You have a beautiful home you've decorated. You have a beautiful home that you've renovated. You're so proud. It's yours. It's mine. Homestead. Nobody could take it from me. It's homestead. No, you're not the Balabayas. I don't care what it says, who has title. I don't care what it says in the official offices. I don't care if you have it homesteaded. It's not yours. We're not the Balabayas. It's temporarily. It's temporarily ours. Kili kol haaretz. Everything belongs to Hashem. Everything belongs to Hashem. It's a story they tell. Two Jews were fighting over a piece of real estate and they came to Rechaim Belozhner. They came to the Heligan Nefesh Rechaim. They were fighting over a piece of real estate. Each one said, it's mine. And the other one said, it's mine. And they're fighting, fighting, fighting. And they're bickering and they're fighting over the piece of land. Each one said, it's theirs. So Rechaim Belozhner got up and he said, come with me. And they went to the piece of land. And they were waiting to see what would the great Rechaim Belozhner, the great Rosh Hashiva, Great Talmud Agra, what was he going to do? He's going to measure the land, survey the land, ask other people who owns the land. Why did he want to go to the land? It's the great Rechaim Velazhner, you can almost picture it. He lay down on the ground and he put his ear to the soil, to the earth, to the ground. And they looked at their great Rebbe Rechaim Velazhner, dressed undoubtedly as a Rosh Hashiva. And he's lying on the ground that they're fighting over, the real estate that they're fighting over. And he puts his ear to the ground. And he gets up and they say, Rebbe, what was that? And he says, you know, you say it's yours and you say it's yours. So I wanted to find out from the ground, who does he think it belongs to? So I put my ear to the ground and you know what the ground said? Soon they'll both be mine. Soon they'll both be mine. So he turned to the two and he said, we're going to, we're going to be buried. We're going to be warm food. We're going to return to the ground from which we came. We have very finite mere mortal lives. This is not worth fighting over. He was giving them a message. You're fighting and you're bickering vociferously over this piece of land. Okay, so there are legitimate disagreements. You go to a basin, you determine who owns it. But this is the fight that you're having. Your families aren't talking. I listened. And you know what the land said? Soon enough, I'll own both of them. Neither owns me. Soon enough, they'll both be mine. I'll own both of them. Kili kol ha'aretz. Kaddish Baruch says, kili ha'aretz. It's all mine. Lest you think it's yours, lest you think you have title, lest you think it belongs to you, it all belongs to Hashem. Soloveitchik has a comment here as well. Says Rav Soloveitchik on this, on this Pasuk. You're just passing through. It's like a hotel. You are just guests. You're going to check out. Writes the Rav, Judaism relativizes all human finite values and aptitudes, denying them unconditional commitment. Judaism maintains that creation as such has no ontonic autonomy. God is not only the creator and governor of the world in a, in a physical dynamic sense. You need a dictionary just to read three sentences. You know the Rav, you know when he learned English? The Rav was in Berlin. The Rav came from Chaslavich. The Rav didn't learn English in Europe. He first learned English when he came to America and his English was better than everyone in this room combined. You need a dictionary to read what he says. I'll try to translate. <laughs> God is not only the creator and governor of the world in a physical dynamic sense, whose will determines the mathematical regularity of the cosmic process in all phases, but also the master of everything on a juridic plane. God owns his creations, the endless stretches of the universe from our small earth to the outer fringes of the cosmos. In other words, one can think HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the heavens, He's far off and distant. He's the HaKadosh Baruch Hu of the cosmos. Mathematical, enormous, huge, inaccessible, distant and far off. No, he is all that. But he's also HaKadosh Baruch Hu owns and is involved in and is aware of and intervenes with everything in the here and now. Everything in the here and now. Everything. The land and its fullness are Hashem's. The world and those who dwell therein. Tehillim Chavdalad. The status of man 
is that of a tenant, a sharecropper. This is the idea of Shabbos. The Torah demands temporary withdrawal from one's daily routine so we can shake off the hypnotic influence which material possessions exert over us and face the truth that we are managing someone's estate, not our own. Isn't that a beautiful description? This is what we said earlier, Rabbi Rucham. Shabbos Lashem. Why is it Lashem Hashem? What do Shabbos and Shemitah have in common? The way the Rav says, the hypnotic influence the material possessions exert over us. It's absolutely intoxicating to make money, to look at your bank account rise, to see your revenue, to see your profit, to cash your paycheck, to collect your things. It's intoxicating to think, I'm conquering the world. I'm building a business. I'm killing it in Gashmas. It's hypnotic. It's intoxicating. Seventh year, we stop and we remind ourselves we're managing someone else's estate, not our own. We're just a manager. You know, the person who owns the magnificent estate versus the person who's hired to manage it. The one who's hired to manage it never makes the mistake and never confuses and never thinks they own it. In Hebrew, Shabbos means discontinuation, withdrawal. A man retreats from something which never belonged to him, from a delusion and a mirage that the world is his. The status of man in this world is that of a guardian in whose care the works of Hashem have been placed as a precious charge. He governs the world on behalf of his master representing him. Yet he must not try to usurp privileges and prerogatives which are not his. Whatever man has at his disposal was entrusted to his care by Hashem, the legitimate owner of being. Whatever man earns and enjoys to whatever he holds fast is not his but Hashem's. When we beseech Hashem as the king of the universe emanating by majestic splendor and magnificence, we ipso facto acknowledge his absolute mastery of the world. When we rest on Shabbos, when we withdraw on Shabbos, when we make the statement, Hashem, I'm just the manager. You're in charge. It's your world. It's your property. Kili ha'aretz. Kili ha'aretz. We are just, as the Pasuk says, where is the Pasuk? As the Pasuk says, Ki gerim v'toshavim atem imadi. We're just gerim v'toshavim. It's never fully ours. We're not fully the owners. We are simply the stewards. We're simply the managers of it. That is the mentality that Torah here is talking, of course, about in Israel. Torah is talking specifically in Eretz Yisrael, where um, the mitzvah of Shemitah is primarily observed. But really, the philosophy of it applies wherever we are. Kili Haaretz. It all belongs to. It all belongs to Hashem. We're simply the stewards over it. Which takes us to the next pasuk. Perachafei pasuk Lamidhei. The next pasuk, at least that we're going to look at, after Shemitah and after Yovel, are the Levite cities, the Levim who do not get their own land, but rather get cities within our land, the original model of the community kolo. The Levim are supported by the community so they could sit and learn and study and teach and preach and be role models to the community. So they're not given their own land, but rather the designated cities within the lands of others. Perak Lam, Pasuk Lam and Hay, page 702. <speaking in Hebrew> If your brother becomes impoverished and his means falter in your proximity, strengthen him so that he can live with you. Listen to this. Listen to this. The Vayikur Rabbah, the Medrash, says the following. Who was the person who designated his life to doing chesed, doing loving kindness to others? Was Hillel Azakin. When he was done interacting with his students, he would walk and escort them. Rabbi, where are you going? I'm going to do a mitzvah. What mitzvah are you going to do? You're building a maka? What are you doing? I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to take a bath. Bathing is a mitzvah. It's good for our children when we're trying to get them to take their bath or shower at night. Is that a mitzvah? Person who is designated to take care of and support royalty would look their best, would take care of their best. I, who are created as royalty, B'Tselem Elokim, is not a mitzvah to take care of our best. So the altar of Slavodka, or Nosan Finkel, he would explain this chazal as follows. He would say, hidden within here is a idea which can elevate a person. What is the message of this? 
שאנחנו מרגלים לעשות חסר, הכוונה ללכת להיט וזזולוס. אבל האמת היא שכל הטבע שאדם עושה עם זולוסו, כל הבבייסו הם בני הבייס. הילדים אפילו הם עצמם, הם חסר והליכה בדרוכב של הקדוש ברוך הוא. We make the mistake of thinking, this is one of my wife's pet peeves, we make the mistake of thinking that when it's time to volunteer to do chesed, we have to leave our home. When it's time to do chesed, you go volunteer for Hebra Kaddisha, you go volunteer for Tom Cheshavas, you go volunteer for whatever worthwhile Hatzalah, Chaveram, whatever worthwhile organization you run to go and do and volunteer for chesed for others. But the Torah is telling us here, says the author of Slobodka, that chesed begins... At home. Chiyamucha achicha imach. Imach. Chesed begins at home. That when you do an act of kindness for your spouse or for your children, you're doing chesed too. What's her pet peeve? You know, children in all the schools have chesed hours. They have an obligation of chesed hours they have to volunteer for. So what happens? A mother says, could you watch the kids? Could you help me cook for Yontif? Could you help me clean for Pesach? They say, no, no, no. I have to go get my chesed hours. So I have to go to the neighbor's house to clean for Pesach. The neighbor's house to babysit their kids. The neighbor's house to be able to, cl- to cook for Yantif. So the mother's left. Chesed begins at home. You should get chesed hours for the chesed you do at home too. You don't run out of the house to do chesed, leaving the home wanting, leaving the home needing. Chesed begins at home. And you see this is the altar of Slobodka from Avram Avinu. On the Pasuk, V'achra Echein Kavar Avram Asara Ishto, that Avram buried his wife Sarah, the, the Medrash says, Rodev Tzaka V'Chesed. Rodev Tzaka is Avram. Chesed Shagam V'Chesed L'Sara. This was a Tzaka and a Chesed that he buried his wife? What kind of Tzaka and a Chesed? It's his wife. He wasn't going to bury his wife to buy a burial plot for his wife. That's called by the Medrash Tzaka V'Chesed. What's the answer? Yes. Chesed and Tzaka begin at home. When we show kindness, when we are selfless, when we inconvenience ourselves, when we care about the people closest to us, that too is called staka v'chesed. V'chiyamuch achicha imach. Imach with you. V'chesed and staka for yourself as a tzalem elokim, but more significantly, even for the people around us and with us, chesed begins, chesed begins at home. It's a beautiful insight in this pasuk by the Heliger of Nachman. We've been learning this beautiful sefer Shochan HaShabbos, which is teachings of Rav Nachman, not directly on these psukim, the teachings of Rav Nachman that connect to these psukim. So Pasuk says, When your brother falters, when your brother fails, when he loses his livelihood, when he needs help, when he's struggling, imach. what does the word imach help? What does the word imach add? With you. What do you mean with you? Tom Cheshavah's needs, before Pesach, we had an unprecedented amount of people because of the unprecedented price of matzah and chicken and uh, meat and so on. So, we got up in shul and we said, we have more people than ever that need help to make Pesach. Please, cough it up. Give it over. We need moschitim. And you responded. Baruch Hashem, the community raised almost triple what we asked for in almost one-seventh of the time we gave to raise it. It was incredible. We brought in three truckloads of food and we gave money to people who needed it. So we did all of that. Why? Because Achicha, your brother, our brother, our family needed. Why imach? What do you mean with you? What does that word imach mean with you? So I'll share two interpretations. First from Nachman. Reb Nachman says the following. He says the way that Akash Baruch Hu created the world, that if you have a mana rotsa masayim, whatever you have in life, you always want more. You're never satisfied. You're never complacent. It's never good enough. But you always want more. The latest addition, the newest upgrade, the latest model. You don't buy a, a set of clothing 30 years ago and you wear it for the next 30 years. Fashion changes and you want the latest. You don't have the first edition of the iPhone that ever came out. They're up to uh, whatever, they're up to 13. So you always want the latest edition. People for themselves, if you have 100, you want 200. We always want to upgrade. We always want to turn it in. We always want the latest model. So Rav Nassim in Likutei Alachas and Kedushin, he says, Burega Sha'adam Nafal Vishtakeh B'Taibas HaMamam the moment the person falls, pray to the desire and temptation, to the ambition for money. So you're always trying to climb the ladder. You always want to raise your net worth. You always want more and nicer and bigger and better. That's simply the psyche of a person. That once we fall prey to Taivas Mamon, once we find ourselves in the world of wanting 
material, physical, financial things, then we always want more. So now, Kohalus Rabbah says, Rav Nachman, that's what the Torah is telling us. You know, when it comes to the poor person, you know what we say? You don't need the latest. You don't need more. This is good enough. This should be enough for you. This should cover you. This should be enough for the Seder. This should be enough for you, for your technology needs. This should be enough. When it comes to us, ourselves, we always want more. The latest, the next level, the newest edition, the latest model. And when it comes to the poor, impoverished person, we say, eh, good enough. Bare minimum. They should be happy to be able to subside on the bare minimum. Says Rav Nachman, Talmud Rav Nassim, that's what the Torah is telling us. Imach. Your attitude to the struggles of your brother should be imach. The same standard you have for yourself is the standard you should have for your brother. If you're never satisfied with enough, then you shouldn't be satisfied with enough when it comes to your brother. The same standards you have for yourself are the standards that you should have for others as well. I'll tell you one other interpretation on this quickly. It's from the Heilige Baal Shem Tov. Shem Tov, Bernard Weinberger, Zatzal, and Shem Tov brings down the following. What do you mean he falters with you? Imach. What does that have to do with, with you? If you hear about somebody who needs, whether you know them or not, whether you have a relationship with them or not, you should respond and we should step up and step in and help them. So what does the word imach add? Listen to this inside of the Shem Tov. He quotes from Baal Shem Tov who understands the Mishnah and Avos. Mishnah Nava says, Know what is above you. I and Roa, and I sees, Ozen Shamas, the ear hears, and everything you do is recorded. Now, every generation that preceded us couldn't really understand this. Everything I do, somebody sees. Everything I say, somebody's listening. What does that even mean? But we understand that more than any other. There are satellites in the sky, there are cameras all around. And believe me, whether you want to or not, whether you're given permission or not, Everything you do is being recorded. Everything we do is being listened to. And that's what it means. Who is the ultimate in the sky. He sees, he hears, and he is recording everything we do. But the Baal Shem Tov interpreted it differently. He said, No, who is above you, Hashem. There's a God in the world. And therefore, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu orchestrates everything, your life is carefully, is carefully choreographed and curated. There are no coincidences. Therefore, I and Ra, whatever you see, you were meant to see. Ozen Shamas, whatever you hear, you were meant to overhear. And now what do you do with it? You saw something. Say something. Do something. You heard something. Do something. Chomasecha, the Sefer Nechtavim. Everything will be recorded. It's in a beautiful Bashem. You need to know you don't live in a vacuum. You don't live in privacy. You don't live in confidential. There's a Kurdish Baruch who is watching and he's organized. And if you happen to see or if you happen to hear, if you happen to become aware of something, it's not a coincidence. It's not by chance. It's by design. It's what's meant to be. What will you do with it? How will you react to it? Says the Shem Anato, based on this Bashem. Now we understand. Imach. Imach. You learned about someone's trials or travails. You learned about their hardship or pain. You learned about an opportunity to make a difference. You have to step up and step in. You cannot bury your head. You cannot cover your eyes. You cannot pretend you don't see. We have an obligation, a responsibility to respond. To respond. Moving along. Perachafei Pasuk Lamed Vav. Finishing up. Torah tells us the prohibition. You're not allowed to lend with interest. We are prohibited to lend with interest. We're allowed to end with interest to a non-Jew. But to a Jew, you cannot lend with interest. Why do we distinguish between a non-Jew and a Jew? If lending with interest is immoral and unethical, why can you lend with interest to a non-Jew? And if lending with interest is moral and ethical, why can we not lend with interest to a Jew? And the answer is very simple. The answer is... Because there's nothing wrong with lending with interest. There's a time value to money. If my money were sitting in the bank, it wouldn't be earning a lot of interest, but it could earn interest. I could be making money from my money. And when I lend my money to you and I can't be earning money with my money, I've lost money. So when you pay interest, I'm not actually making a profit. You're just making me whole. There's a time value to money. It's nothing unethical or immoral of lending with interest. However, if my neighbor, if someone I don't know, if somebody's trying to make an investment comes and says, can I borrow money? 
then it's ethical to say, sure, but there's a time value to that money. You have to pay me back with interest. But what happens if my brother or sister come? And they say, I've hit hard times. I don't know how to pay the bills. Can I borrow a few dollars? Can I borrow a few shekel? What are you going to say? Yeah, 8% interest? 5% interest? You're going to charge your brother interest when they've fallen on hard times and they need money? The Torah is trying to condition within ourselves the sense that all Jews are our brother and our sister. Non-Jews are cousins. They're distant relatives. And if they want to borrow money, you could lend them with interest. But Jewish people are our immediate family. They are our nuclear family. And if a brother or sister comes and needs to borrow money, Khalila to lend with interest, it's unethical and it's wrong. The Medrash here quotes, A person's heart is drawn to want to lend with ribbis. It's very easy to convince ourselves, you know, it's only right. There's a time value to money. I need to be made whole. There's nothing wrong with it. So therefore, therefore the Torah has to say, The test of your Yuri Shemayim is your attitude towards money. The Medrash Tanchum and Mishpatim says, if you lend with interest, you are not God-fearing. Why? Because if you lend with interest, you're concerned that you won't be able to make that money any other way. You don't believe in Hashem. If you believe in Hashem that you'd lend a fellow Jew without interest, then know that Hashem will make it up to you in another way. Our attitude towards money, Rav Yerucham, is our third or fourth Rav Yerucham of the day. Rav Yerucham says our attitude towards money, our attitude towards money reflects our relationship with Hashem. And I'll end by telling you a very discouraging story. That's a bad way to end. But it's a very discouraging story. So much more to tell you. But a very discouraging story. I had a meeting the other day. I won't say in which community or in which state. And I won't say with whom. And I won't say with which type of Jew. But I'll just tell you it was a meeting to secure somebody's services. And they said, don't forget to bring cash. I said, why would I bring cash? I said, so you don't have to pay the taxes. I said, why wouldn't I pay the taxes? It's a halacha. Dina de Mahlus Adina. To be honest, I have integrity. You have to pay the taxes. So he said to me, you know, in 30 years of doing business, you're only the second person to ever want to pay taxes. And the first worked as a tax auditor and felt he had to. You're only the second person ever to pay taxes. So I said, you know, you're somebody who's Shomer Torah and Mitzvos. You're from a community that scrupulously observes Shabbos and Kashrus and Taras and Mishpacha. You follow every Chumr you can find. Maybe you should be machmir that it's stealing to not pay taxes. I'm the second client or customer you've ever had who wants to pay taxes. I didn't know that it was optional. I didn't know it was negotiable. It's Geneva. You're stealing from the other taxpayer who has to pay more when you don't pay your share. Dina de Machus Adina, we live in this country. We benefit from its services. Of course you have to pay taxes. Our attitude towards money is the true test of our year I'll tell you, it was not a small amount of money to be saved on the taxes. But my Olam Haba is worth a whole lot more than that. I'm not selling my Olam Haba for the difference of that taxes. I'm not telling you to show off or I'm anything special. I think it should be hopefully obvious to us all. But Rabbi Yerucham says, why with the mitzvah of, of interest? Because when it comes to money and the temptation of money and wanting to save a few bucks about money, that is the test of whether you really have Yerushalayim. Not how hard you shuckle and not how many chumras you keep, but are you honest and do you have integrity? Do we keep business practices? Are we honest in business? That says everything about our about our Yira Shemayim. Wishing everyone a beautiful Lag Ba'omer coming up. Lag Ba'omer is Hod Shebahod. In the Kabbalistic uh, calculation, the seven weeks each have a, a theme for the week and the days within the week have a theme. And the theme of Lag Ba'omer is Hod Shebahod. The, the Chassam Sofer says the day the man first fell. It's a day of being grateful, seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary. So wishing everyone tomorrow night, Thursday, a beautiful Lag Ba'omer. Fire should burn, should elevate the memory of those we lost last year, and the fire should burn in us. We should be on fire, Torah and mitzvah and Amuna. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy.